On Friday morning, March 19, 1982, guitarist Randy Rhodes was talked into taking a joyride in a single-engine airplane on a day off from Ozzy Osbourne's Diary of a Madman tour. The five-minute flight would mark the final moments of Rhodes' 25-year-old life. In this video, we're going to take a look at the tragic death of Randy Rhodes. This is a story of how a few bad decisions by a bus driver killed Randy Rhodes and mark one of the music industry's most needless deaths. But before we get started, subscribe to our channel Weird History, leave a comment, and let us know what you think about the video. As we all know, musicians have had a long history of horrendous aircraft disasters. Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper died in an airplane crash in 1959. Stevie Ray Vaughan died in a helicopter crash in 1990. Several members of Leonard Skinner died when their private tour plane crashed in 1977. And of course, there were airplane-related deaths of Patsy Cline in 1963, Otis Redding in 1967, Jim Croce in 1973, Ricky Nelson in 1985, and Aaliyah in 2001. And the list goes on and on. Technically, these were all on-the-job deaths. It doesn't make the passing of these musicians any less painful, but knowing that their work-related reason behind her demise does make it a little easier to accept. That's why the death of Randy Rhodes might be the most painful of all airplane-related deaths among musicians. Rhodes wasn't traveling in the single-engine airplane on March 18th because he needed to get to a gig. He was just a passenger on a joyride piloted by Ozzy Osbourne's bus driver. But before we cover that, let's go back and find out more about Randy. Prodigy is a term that gets thrown around a lot in the world of music, but Randy Rhodes was a true musical savant. By the time Rhodes was seven, he began taking folk and classical guitar lessons at Mizonia, a music school in North Hollywood that his mother owned. By his early teens, Rhodes had surpassed his guitar instructor, and he had already formed several bands while he was in high school. When high school became a distraction from his budding music career, he graduated early so he could spend time teaching guitar and gigging around Los Angeles at night. In 1972, a 16-year-old Rhodes formed the band that would eventually become Quiet Riot. But after seven years of failing to secure an American record contract and dealing with inner band fighting, he accepted an invitation, after a lot of coaxing, to audition for Ozzy Osbourne's new solo project. Rhodes wasn't initially thrilled by being the guitarist for Osbourne, who he considered a member of the old guard. His childhood friend and early Quiet Riot bandmate Kelly Garney put it this way, when Randy and I were growing up, we thought Black Sabbath was a ridiculous thing. They were something that we made fun of. We parodied them all the time. We thought they were just funny. We thought they were a joke. To say Randy Rhodes saved Ozzy Osbourne wouldn't be entirely false. It's common knowledge that when Osbourne was fired from Black Sabbath on April 27, 1979 for his compulsive drug use and inability to collaborate with the rest of the band, everyone, even Ozzy, counted himself out. Eventually, somehow, Osborne began looking for a band to help him with a solo career. After a brief audition in front of a wasted Osborne that left Rhodes as confused as it left him frustrated, Randy flew to England, where he'd eventually co-write and record Blizzard of Oz in 1980 and Diary of a Madman in 1981. Within two years, Randy Rhodes reshaped Ozzy Osbourne's sound and revived his career. By March 18, 1982, after a concert in Knoxville Civic Coliseum, Osborne was officially halfway into his six-month-long Diary of a Madman tour, and according to live reviews, every gig had been a sold-out success. Even the show in Des Moines, Iowa a few weeks earlier where he bit the head off a live bat only strengthened Osborne's legend. On March 19th, Osborne had scheduled a day off, so the crew's plan was to drive south overnight from Knoxville, Tennessee on Interstate 75 to Leesburg, Florida. In Leesburg, they'd make a stop at Jerry Calhoun's tour bus dealership to fix the failing air conditioning unit on their tour bus. The scheduled day off also meant Osborne was free to drink, so he immediately started knocking back alcohol on the bus during the nine-hour drive to Florida, which frustrated Rose who rarely drank and never touched drugs. According to his 2011 biography, Osborne recalls the final thing Rhodes said to him on the bus that night about his excessive drinking. You'll kill yourself, you know, one of these days. As Ozzy, his band, and his crew pulled into Calhoun's property early on Friday, March 19th, the agenda for the day was simply to recuperate and find someone to fix the air conditioning. Jerry Calhoun's Florida property was huge. Besides housing his tour bus sales and leasing company, the grounds included Calhoun's mansion and a private airfield, which he called Flying Baron Estates Airport. By all accounts, Osborne and his entourage were planning on spending the day on Calhoun's property. Their next gig wasn't until the following evening on March 20th, supporting Foreigner at the Tangerine Bowl some 43 miles away in Orlando, Florida. So the full day off would allow the band to regroup. Ozzy and his crew arrived at Calhoun's property pretty early in the morning, a little bit before 9 a.m. While Ozzy, Sharon, his manager, and fiancé 
and bass player Rudy Sarzo slept in, Rhodes and several other crew members exited the bus, stretched their legs, and explored the grounds. While walking around Calhoun's property, Andrew Aycock, Osborne's tour bus driver, found a single-engine Beechcraft F-35 plane. Although Aycock was a certified private pilot, his license to fly was invalid. Still, he thought it'd be fun to take the Beechcraft on a quick flight around Calhoun's property. Sometime around 9 a.m., Aycock asked the members of the crew if any of them were interested in taking flight with him in the four-seater. He recruited keyboardist Don Airy and tour manager Jake Duncan, and without permission, took the Beechcraft out for a quick spin. After a few minutes of taking laps around the property, Aycock landed and asked the crew if anyone else wanted to make a second trip. Although, according to friends, he was never comfortable with air travel, Rhodes agreed to ride along with Rachel Youngblood, the band's 58-year-old cook, costume designer, and makeup artist. Incidentally, Rhodes woke Rudy Sarzo up and tried to coax him onto the flight as the fourth passenger, but Sarzo declined and chose to get some extra sleep instead. The second flight with Rhodes and Youngblood started off normal, they took a couple more laps around Calhoun's property. Then Aycock decided to play a prank on the crew by buzzing the tour bus. Aycock steered the airplane twice toward Osborne's bus, both times getting close enough to alert the crew, but he pulled out and shot back upwards with plenty of time to spare. On his third attempt, Aycock drove the Beechcraft towards the tour bus and banked off at a 45 degree angle. The airplane's lower wing grazed the coach just enough to rip it off, sending the rest of the Beechcraft hurtling into a nearby tree. The airplane sheared off the top of the tree, causing it to tumble in the air and into the garage of Calhoun's mansion. According to Osborne's autobiography, the initial impact of the bus caused Rose and Youngblood's head to crash through the plane's windshield, killing them instantly. The one-wing airplane burst into flames on impact. Half of Calhoun's mansion burnt to the ground and all three bodies were burnt beyond recognition. Rhodes was identified by personal jewelry, while Aycock and Youngblood were ID'd with dental records. Sharon Osborne was asleep on the bus and awoken by the crash. She said of Rhodes, Aycock, and Youngblood, they were all in bits. It was just body parts everywhere. Ozzy's official statement to crash investigators was a bit more descriptive. I was awoken from my sleep by a loud explosion. I immediately thought we hit the vehicle on the ground. I got out of bed screaming to my fiance Sharon, get off the bus. Meanwhile, she was screaming to everyone else to get off the bus. After getting out of the bus, I saw the plane had crashed. I didn't know who was on the plane at the time. When we realized that the people were on the plane, I found it very difficult to get assistance from anyone to help. In fact, it took almost a half hour before anyone arrived. The FAA conducted toxicology tests on all three corpses and found that Rhodes only had nicotine in his system. Aycock, though, tested positive for cocaine. Ever since the crash, there have been rumors regarding Aycock's state of mind, and whether his actions were a byproduct of drug-fueled recklessness or something more sinister. It wasn't reported at the time, but Aycock's soon-to-be ex-wife was present during the crash. According to witnesses, Aycock's estranged wife appeared at one of Osborne's previous shows on the southern leg of his tour and insisted she ride with the band of Florida. The theory is that Aycock saw his estranged wife standing nearby as he was buzzing over Osborne's bus and in a snap decision, he attempted to scare her with the wing of the airplane on his third attempt. In Rudy Sarzo's 2016 autobiography, he states that Osborne's keyboardist Don Airy and drummer Tommy Aldridge were the only two witnesses of the crash. Sarzo also stated that Ari and Aldridge told him that they saw a struggle in the cockpit between Aycock and Rhodes right before the crash. Was Rhodes trying to stop Aycock from a reckless maneuver? Was Aycock intentionally trying to scare his wife while they were going through a messy divorce? There were no cockpit recordings, so we'll never know what happened that day. But the cocaine in Aycock's system and the fact that he hadn't slept in 24 hours definitely played a factor in the death of Randy Rhodes. At the time of his death, Rhodes already decided to leave Osborne's band once his contractual obligations had been fulfilled. While Rhodes was on friendly terms with Osborne, he was fed up with his boss's debauchery and unstable and confrontational behavior. According to Sharon and Ozzy Osborne, a deal was struck with an unhappy Rhodes. He had record Speak of the Devil and then leave the band. He was planning on dropping out of the world of rock for a while to pursue his degree in classical guitar at UCLA. Of course, those plans were cut short. So what do you think? Was Randy Rhodes' death caused by a stunt gone wrong, or did Andrew Aycock have a vengeful motive? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other music stories of our weird history.